The last few weeks on Transcendence have been, let's just say, difficult. It seems like Murphy's Law is applying here, because everything that can go wrong, kind of is going wrong. Murphy's Law. And the culprit of all this pain is, well, just the nose cone. It seems like this should be a lot easier, because it's literally just a piece of material that's between the airstream and the payload, protecting it from those high aero forces. But it turns out that for us, this ended up being quite complicated. So we're going to talk about the strategy that we used to build a nose cone, why it was so difficult, and maybe some key takeaways that could help improve this process in the future. And we hope you gain a bit of an appreciation for the true difficulty behind building a nose cone for a rocket. The nose cone that Ash is building is called an O-Give nose cone, which is somewhat of a complex shape. So what this means is that in order to generate the convergence onto the tip of the cone, you use basically spherical sections that connect to the cylindrical section of the piece that's going to connect with the rocket. Okay. This means it's not quite a cone, but rather kind of a circular cone, and that adds a little bit of complexity into the geometry. So we had to think of a way that we could build this complex geometry and still preserve the nose cone smoothness and aerodynamic characteristics that we wanted it to have in order to still function as a nose cone. And since we're building a lot of the rocket structure out of carbon fiber using the winding machine, we thought it would be natural to just kind of use that same winding machine to make the nose cone. But unfortunately we can't really use carbon fiber because it turns out that carbon fiber is not really translucent to the radio frequencies that we want to use in order to send signals back to the ground. So the avionics guys told me no carbon fiber. So we had to come up with a material that was translucent to the radio signals that go to the ground. And unfortunately this also rules out any kind of metal. So we couldn't use aluminum or steel or copper or anything like that. So it turns out there are other kinds of fibers that you can use to wind, not just carbon fiber, but you can also use things like fiberglass. And lucky for us, fiberglass is translucent to radio frequencies. He is the one. We did some searching and we found a fiberglass that was nearly as strong as the carbon fiber that we're using, and it seemed to be a good fit for what we wanted. So we went ahead and ordered this fiberglass. And this is where the saga of the nose cone nightmare begins. So it turns out there's a bit of a fiberglass shortage in the world right now, and it's actually a little bit more difficult to get fiberglass than we thought it was originally. We tried a lot of contractors, and it turns out a lot of them were out of stock. Finally, we found one that was able to deliver to us relatively quickly, and we paid the money and sent the order. But then some weeks went by, and no fiberglass. So we had to kind of chase that up a bit. And when we were finally able to get them on the phone, it turns out they had mysteriously lost our order, and there wouldn't be any fiberglass coming until earliest October. Murphy's Law. We had to cancel that order and try to again go through and start searching for another contractor. We finally did find one. This time we actually took receipt of the fiberglass only one week after ordering, so it looks like everything was good. But then we opened the box and it turns out that the fiberglass wasn't really what we were expecting. This mistake's on us because we didn't really read the fine print of what this fiberglass was. Okay, so the problem we have here is that basically the fiberglass has come on this drum here. But uh, instead of unraveling from the outside, like out here, it's actually unraveling from the inside. And that's a bit of a problem because basically um, the way it winds on our machine is that we put it onto like a rod and then it's supposed to unwind from the outside. So we don't really have a way to get it to unwind from the inside. Murphy's Law. So we have to kind of come up with a solution here to try and fix this. One issue I was having even with the transportation is that um, it was just unraveling all by itself on the inside. So we have basically all of this fiberglass that just <laughs> came out unintentionally. So uh, in order to stop that in the temporary, I basically uh, had to tape some, some paper on the inside to make it so that it wouldn't keep unraveling. But the way we're gonna fix this basically is we have some PVC here that we can use as kind of like our makeshift drum. Obviously I don't have the exact size that it is on the inside right now. So what I'm gonna to do to compensate for that is basically take this aluminum sheet that I have here and I'm gonna wrap it into a cylinder on the inside of the wall. So after I've wrapped that on the inside of the wall, I'm going to use some of this foam here, this stuff, and I'm gonna wrap that between the aluminum and the PVC pipe. So theoretically, that should give us a tight fit and allow us to actually use the interface that we have on the winding machine. So uh, yeah, let's see if it works. But before we can actually start winding, we have to have something to wind onto. 
obviously. So we need some sort of shape that we can wind onto that is the same shape as the nose cone. And that basically is our mandrel. Logically, the easiest way to do this would be to use a machine, like a lathe, in order to cut some sort of material into that shape that we wanted. But unfortunately, we don't have access to a lathe right now. This is really a big Astra problem. If you know someone with a lathe and you want to help Astra out somewhere in the Bremen area, please let me know. Because we're still really searching for a lathe that we can use. So, without a lathe, we kind of had to come up with some sort of alternative solution to building this piece. And we have access to a lot of 3D printers, so we thought, ah, why don't we just 3D print this mold? So we drew up some designs where basically we would print out a mandrel sort of in sections. So we have like rings that we would put together and that would kind of build out our entire cone. And it would be like hollow on the inside and we would glue those rings together and then boom, we have our mandrel. But unfortunately, it turns out that our 3D printing machines actually were not quite wide enough to accommodate the full diameter of the bottom section rings. Murphy's Law. Shut up! So, once again, we had to kind of improvise our way around the limitations of our tools. To solve this, we kind of had to design like a Lego nose cone, where we basically printed out the sections instead of in full circles, we printed them out in sections of circles. And these could all fit on the 200 millimeter uh, by 200 millimeter printer that we were using. It was a lot of printing, <laughs> some days of printing, but finally, after about a week, uh, we were able to get all the sections and get them ready to be stacked. Basically the way this works is we have these overlapping slaps which can be kind of glued together and we put three of them together to make a ring and then the rings have these grooves around the top which slot into the next ring and those can be glued together and basically you can stack the entire nose cone and glue it all together and you have your mandrel. So with, all, with our mandrel ready and our fiber ready, we are ready to get into the lab and see if we could wind a nose cone. Now laying onto a complex shape is actually a bit difficult because when you're using the machine, you basically have control over uh, four axes of movement. You can move the mandrel back and forth. You can spin the cylinder around and around. You can also rotate the spindle. And of course you can move the spindle back and forth in and out. When you're winding a tube, you actually only actuate two of these axes, just back and forth and the rotation of the mandrel. Obviously for a nose cone, you have to do a little bit more than that because now you actually have to move in and out as you go down the length of the nose cone because it's going to be getting smaller on the tip and wider at the, at the base. But the other thing you have to think about is that as you move down the nose cone, the amount of rotation that you need in order to achieve the same angle actually changes. So if you want to keep the angle that you spin the fiber onto the mandrel the same across the entire nose cone, which is ideal for structural reasons, you actually kind of have to change the rotation rate as you move down the length of the nose cone. But this was no problem. We basically split the nose cone into five different sections and we wrote some code that basically changed the spin rate as we moved the mandrel down the length of the nose cone. And the problems that we had started immediately because obviously the first thing you do when you set up the machine is you put the fiber into the fiber holder. So we started to do that we noticed that ah actually the fiber drum is actually too big for the actual holder that we that we're using to hold the fiber. Murphy's law. So to solve this we had to actually raise the, the holder so that it would be far enough away that it wouldn't interfere with any of the other parts of the machine. As we started laying the first layer, it became apparent that the fiber wasn't exactly rolling the way we wanted it to. And because the fiber wasn't rolling properly, it was putting a lot of stress onto the nose cone and causing it to bend. And just like that, it broke. Basically, we had to abandon the top of the nose cone because it had broken off and we didn't really have a strategy for reattaching it in a way that it wouldn't break off again. But alas, four-fifths of the nose cone is still all right. I just think needs to learn how to adapt, Murph, like the rest of us. So we reconfigured the top of the nose cone so it could interface into the machine and then got right back to winding. And we were on the clock because that resin was already in the bath and starting to harden. In order to compensate for the fact that the fiber was not spinning properly, unfortunately we had to actually manually hold the fiberglass and kind of manually spin it off the drum so there wasn't any tension being applied on the fiber as it was being laid onto the, onto the mandrel, which was really a pain in the ass because, oh my god, that fiberglass gets heavy after a while and it totally screws up your fingers because the fiberglass is being held on this threaded rod and in order to hold it up, you have to hold on the threaded rod while you spin it. So it's kind of gently cutting into your skin the entire time it's doing this. 
one eternity later. And there it is. Ta-da! The monument of all of our struggles. We had finally wound at least part of the nose cone. The only step left at this point was to actually get that fiberglass off of the mandrel. And unfortunately, to date, we have not been successful in this just yet. Vegas. So the key takeaways are this. Number one, definitely get the right tool for the job. So if you have a situation where fiberglass is kind of wound in the wrong way, uh, it's better just to reconfigure that completely, transpool it, or get a different fiberglass drum because messing around with fixing it and trying to make it work is really not worth it. And in the end, this is basically the primary culprit for all of the problems because if the fiberglass was working properly, it wouldn't have put stress on the mandrel, it wouldn't have broken our mandrel, and we, we would have been able to wind properly and just fine. The second takeaway is that using a 3D printed mandrel is maybe not the best. It would have worked better if we had like one continuous part or at least just the sections where there were like ring sections but having the segmented ring sections was probably a bit too much of an issue. I suspect this is part of the problem as to why it's not coming off the mantle right now. Resin can basically get into the cracks as you build up that nose cone. And for the resin in the cracks, that's creating friction that's gonna prevent you from pulling off the part in the end. We'll see if this is actually the case, because of course, once you actually get it off somehow, we will be able to see exactly how the resin kind of filled the gaps or not. Finally, the last thing we learned is a bit of a material supply thing, which is that you really wanna go and look for the things that you need well in advance. Because if you get into a situation where you're rushed and you're trying to get something really fast, you make mistakes and then you end up with something that you didn't want or in a place where you actually get delayed and you don't get to do the thing you wanna do. So there you have it, the saga of the nose cone. If you found this video informative, be sure to give it a like. And remember to expand your horizons.